Thank you, brothers and sisters. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, welcome to a moment of mourning and celebration for the life of Sister Gail Dudley uh, and Dwayne Dudley, who passed at a time when we couldn't get together like this. So that's part of our, part of our uh, memory and our celebration today. We want to welcome all of the family and express our condolences to the family for this passing and this loss. And my name is Brian Jackson. I'm from the Pleasant View Third Ward. I'm bishop there. And uh, presiding at this meeting is Kelly Reeves, president of the Provo, Utah, Sharon East Stake. And we welcome all friends and members of the ward, neighbors, and family here this morning. The family prayer uh, a moment ago was offered by Jim Dudley, who's a son of Gail. And the program will proceed as follows. We will all sing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn number 66, and we would like to thank Kay Woodworth and Diane Brown for providing the music for us today. After the singing, we'll have an opening prayer by Jeff Keith, a son-in-law, and then we'll proceed to that point.
Our dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be gathered to celebrate the life of Dwayne and Gail Dudley and for the exemplary testament they've borne throughout their lives by the examples they've set to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all their posterity, to their friends and neighbors. And we celebrate all the good things they've done throughout their lives and the choices they've made. And we're grateful for their example. And we ask thy spirit to be here with us to give us the strength and, and the spirit we need at this wonderful time. And we say these things now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The program will proceed as follows. We'll hear four legacies of mom and dad. A legacy of faith by Jesse Hafen, grandson. A legacy of love and inclusivity, Melissa Brooks, granddaughter. Then we'll be pleased to hear a musical number, Thou Gracious God Whose Mercy Lends, with the Keith family and Colin Jensen on bagpipes. We'll also have Katie writing a granddaughter accompanying. After that, we'll hear two more, a legacy of music by Dan Riding, a grandson, and then finally a legacy of laughter by Jim Dudley, a son. And then, as fitting for the Dudleys, another musical number, Meditation from Tyus by Jules Messonet, and Claudine Bigelow will be playing uh, on the viola with Scott Holden on piano. And then it'll be my privilege to address you for a few closing remarks, and we'll proceed to that point. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Um, as Bishop Jackson said, my name is Jesse Hafe, and I was one of the grandchildren, of, one of the grandsons of uh, Gail and Dwayne Dudley. And uh, I moved in with them when I was 10 years old, lived with them until I was 19 when I served my mission. So I had nine years living with them um, in their basement that forever changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm grateful for that every single day. Um, <clears throat> Legacy of faith. Um, I'm grateful for this topic. This is something definitely that my grandparents taught me and that is, I'm sure is shared with the entire family. Um, first legacy that I would like to share of faith um, is titled, I've chosen love for our Heavenly Father, love for Jesus Christ, and love for each other. Journal entry by my grandma, written October 2021. She wrote, the wonderful men in my life, First and foremost, my Heavenly Father, that I am able to communicate with him each day and bear my testimony, either of joy or sorrows or problems surrounding me. Also for the greatness in my heart, for the blessings that he has poured out upon me. The next for the peace of love of Jesus Christ and his teachings and examples in my life. I love the scriptures surrounding me throughout my life. I feel the love and reassurance in my life when I do my best to choose the right way of life through his teachings. My love for him surpasses my words. And then this is what she says about her love for her husband. Next, my dear husband, who has stood by me, taught me the gospel questions I asked in such clarity that I was thrilled. He has been so good to me and provided a home and type of life that I could never truly fully express my love to him. He is my best friend and companion through all my challenges and joys. He has blessed me with his priesthood many times and it has thrilled me with the spirit of healing. I shall love him forever. As a husband myself, I cannot think of greater, a greater gift and greater words to be said to me at the end of my life than those by my grandma that she said about her husband. Number two, tithing. Journal entry by my grandma, July 2017. <clears throat> she wrote, during the depression in the 1930s, my folks were struggling with three children. They had been married about 10 years. My father was a barber and my mother a beautician. Curling women's hair in her shop in our home, she was actually paid in cash. One evening, she started counting out her money at the kitchen table. As a family, this is where we all gathered, at the kitchen table while dinner was being made or listening to the table radio. My brother was there and dad. Now, my father was a good, honest man, but he was not active and did not know the gospel. Many of our family interaction was around the kitchen table. He watched her sorting and putting some of the money in the envelope. He asked her what she was doing. I am counting out my tithing as much as I can for you too. Now that little comment was a little dig for my father 
as he was not active. He really knew little of the doctrine. My father was a good man, but not active in the church. He paid his bills faithfully, but really watched the income in order to meet and make ends meet. He watched her for a while and then said, don't you think we need that money more than the bishop? There was a little silence, then dad added, and how do you know if he'll ever send it to Salt Lake? She looked at him in the eye and answered, he can throw it in the Port New forever for all I care, but the Lord will know I paid my tithing. Dad had no answer. So my mother taught me the importance of paying tithing at a very age, young age. I would carefully set the tithing aside before I ever used the rest of it. I have been blessed by my mother's teachings. Tithing has not been a challenge. I have also married a good man that believed this commandment as much as I do. I recognize that paying tithing and a healthy fast offering has been a blessing to us. And as I've heard my Uncle Jeff say many times, um, as he's been bishop of this ward and this chapel in the past, um, my grandparents always paid a very generous missionary donation and tithing. <clears throat> Speaking of tithing, when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old, my grandparents live on that, that hill. Saturday mornings, my grandma would pound on my door and wake me up, only to get me out in the morning to weed the morning glory on the hill, which I hated every Saturday. She would talk to me about the weeds and how they need to be watered in certain areas and how to get rid of them. And when we were done, she would give me an allowance and it was always paid in coins. And she did that on purpose because I guarantee you she wanted me to figure out how to figure out I had 10% and put in this little cardboard box that she bought me that was divided into three sections. One was spending, the next one was missionary fund, and then tithing. And she made sure that I put 10% in coins in that every time. Another example real fast, a couple of years ago, my career changed out of the blue and finances became a real concern for me trying to support a family of four with my beautiful wife. I have a text message here from my grandma. <clears throat> I sent her, Grandma, will you please keep me in your prayers? Trying to make the right decisions with my career right now is really challenging. Trying to feel confident in providing financially for my family right now. I know that your prayers will help me. She replied, yes, of course. Keep tithing going no matter what. Trials come and surely challenge faith. Also scripture reading and bending knees with your wife's hand in yours. And then on all caps, courage. Number three, prayers, blessings. Growing up, I was the... Uh, I was the one in the house that loved fishing and hunting in the outdoors, riding horses and causing trouble. There were so many times where back then we didn't have cell phones or uh, pagers even. And then so when we went hunting or camping with my friends, it was a matter of telling grandma I'm leaving on Tuesday and I should be back on Thursday or Friday. I remember <clears throat> on that specific hunt, I was a senior in high school, we shot a deer and we gutted that thing and we hadn't showered in three or four days and I remember being dropped off at grandma's house at, it was the better part of probably close to one in the morning and I knew I needed to sneak in the home because I was covered in dirt and I stunk. Opened the door quietly, the, the house was dark, only to look over to see the lamp on. <clears throat> Sorry. And like I caught her so many times on her knees, praying for a long time. And I sat there and I waited till she was done. And I asked her what she was praying about. And she said to make sure you got home safe. Grandma was always praying for others. I caught her in the home praying probably in every single room of that house, and I think she did it on purpose so that I would see her praying. <laughs> I'm serious. She was always ashamed of her skinny legs, and I think that's <laughs> which I inherited. And I think uh, the carpet was wore out by so many chairs and so many beds in those rooms from her praying. My grandpa, on the other hand, it was the blessings that I looked forward to <clears throat> in college, countless times when I had exams coming up or when I was sick or I was struggling with personal matters, I knew that if I got a blessing from my grandpa, that I would be helped. When grandpa gave prayers 
before he gave blessings, as so many of you know, it was as if you were listening to a general authority speak. His countenance would change, his voice would change, the words he spoke would be very unique, and it was always a pleasure to be around him. Number four, selfless service or missionary work. Journal entry, August 2004 from my grandma. Do I really have a light in my eyes? She wrote, I went to Macy's food store. On my way to the car to put groceries in the trunk, I noticed two missionaries by their bikes with lots of sacks of groceries. One approached me while I was putting my food in the trunk. He asked me if I could help them. They asked me if I could take their groceries for them in my car and meet them at their apartment, which is towards Center Street in Provo. I said, of course. So while they were putting their bags in my car, I asked them how they knew that I would even show up. The one elder answered, because I could see the light in your eyes. I considered that a compliment. I then told them that I was a member of the church. The funny part was that I could not find their address, so I was a good 10 minutes late in finding them. They were standing by their door, waiting and looking and looking, probably got thinking. Anyways, I hope that the gospel does make my countenance show light to others. This experience got me thinking that I need to do even better. I love the missionaries. If you knew my grandparents or you at all, you knew all they did was serve. My grandpa was all about routine, routine, routine. In the morning he would get up, I remember the tray he would make his breakfast on, I remember the oversized shredded wheat that he would squish up in his hands, throw in a bowl, put raisins on, and milk. I thought it was the most disgusting thing in the world. And he would go to his office and he would do family history work until lunch, literally never coming out of the room. After lunch, or at lunch, he would come up, switch the tray and the food out, go back to his office and do family history work some more. I thought, what a boring life, you know? He's retired, he could travel, they could do whatever they want, but that's what he chose to do. Grandpa served 18 years in the stake and ward leadership callings. He served a mission with my grandma to BYU Jerusalem as an associate director. My grandpa took me with him home teaching countless times, and it was a pleasure to hear him teach and watch him speak. This quote that I saw when I was in institute in college above one of the teacher's doors sums up my grandpa to a T. It says, bear your testimony all the time, and if necessary, use words. That was my grandpa. My grandma, on the other hand, was going 100 miles an hour all the time in every direction. <clears throat> I don't know how she got the energy. I definitely missed this part of the family. And you'll have to bear with me as I sum this up with a few personal examples as she served me. My grandma hated fish, hated fish, hated hunting, hated anything to do with that. And I remember countless times as a young kid begging her to drop me and my friends off at Utah Lake to go catfishing. <clears throat> what you don't know about catfishing is the best bait for catfish is bloody chicken liver. And so we would make her stop by the grocery store to buy that, go to Utah Lake, drop us off. Back then we didn't have sunscreen or mosquito repellent, two packs of grape shasta and candy. And I would say, don't pick us up till dark. That's when the fish bite. Um, she didn't wait till dark, but she definitely picked us up like clockwork every time. Hopping in the car, only smelling like fish guts, dirt, and Utah Lake, dirty water. Only to beg her to take us again, which she did countless times. My grandma helped me start a lawn mowing business when I was 13. She bought a lawnmower and a weed eater for me and made me earn the money back. She helped me put that lawnmower and weed eater in the back of her red Chevy car hatchback and drove me all over Provo and Orem to make sure that I mowed the lawns. She ch double checked that I did it right, made sure I paid my tithing. I had a paper route that started at 5.30 in the morning. She made sure that I folded those papers just perfectly in a rubber band, put them in the bag, and that I didn't just throw it on the driveway, but that I walked up and sat it on the doorstep. She taught me piano for four years and I hated every minute of it. <laughs> I wasn't blessed like the rest of these people with music <clears throat> in this family. She, trained, she taught me the importance of yard work. If you go in her backyard, there stands a tricolored beech tree. There's only two of those in my life. They're, they're, they're a unique, beautiful tree. One's in the front of my, my dad's house and the other's in the backyard of my grandparents. It's the biggest, most beautiful one you've ever seen and I helped my grandma plant that tree. When I got home from my mission, she helped me buy my wife's wedding ring by co-signing for me because I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Coming up the stairs in high school, yelling to me before she even told me, I can smell your cologne, they'll smell you from a mile away. You want, you want the girls to get close to smell it on you, not, not from that far. <laughs> all the time. But most of all, all the countless handwritten letters that she has wrote to me in my life to keep the faith and to make sure that I knew 
that I was worth something. And finally, <clears throat> legacy five, one of my grandma's favorite phrases, this too shall pass. Journal entry written January 29th, 2021, titled, My Feelings Early This Morning, 18 Days After My Dear Husband Made It to the Other Side. She wrote, Each time I pray, I can't find words enough thanking my Heavenly Father for blessings and knowledge of the gospel and the plan of salvations. I studied for that knowledge. I had an inner feeling that told me that I was on the right path to find it. The Lord was beside me in answer to my prayers. So my hope is to each of you that you will also seek in prayer and find the reason for your birth. Ask why, ask how, ask when, ask is it true. Maybe you'll wanna ask if there is somebody even there who is listening. I always knew there was someone because my mother and father taught me that and I had an inner peace knowing it. Start reading, don't wait, do it now, life is short. The only way to pure happiness is joy in finding Christ in your life and Heavenly Father that hears your prayers. One big caution, don't make your own rules. I'll close by telling you, telling my grandparents, five children, my mom, my aunts, my Uncle Jim, every time I'm around you, I feel these legacies of faith. <clears throat> I feel them deeply. And to my Aunt Sunny, who literally put her life on hold and moved in with my grandma, taking care of her for so many months, you, are truly an angel. Your example of Christ-like love has been unmatched in my eyes, and in my opinion, you sealed your place in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So, uh, let me think. This was Christmas time, maybe a couple years ago. Uh, I was coming to Grandma's house, like we always do. Um, and she usually has some gifts for everybody or some things that she's prepared. And guess what? She had these big t-shirts <laughs> here that she made. Isn't this fantastic? She said, look, look, you can, it's for your crafts. And you can put things in here and you can... You can uh, wear this and, you know, keep, keep things. Well, you, so I thought, okay, this is, this is going to be the perfect thing for me to wear for the talk. I, I shouldn't be wearing anything else here. I'm just going to have you guys see me as grandma. And then as I give you this message, because I get to speak about love, five minutes about the legacy of love, how do I do this? It's an impossible task. I, I think that it would be impossible for any of us when we start to think about every single way that grandma showed love in her life to all of us. We all have moments that we can think of because as Becky said, nobody was her favorite and she made everyone feel like they were her favorite, every single one of us. We all felt that. And so um, I do have a few things to share because I got to text uh, the children of Gail and Duane, my, my aunts and uncle and um, they had a lot of good comments. These are very small things. But I love this about Grandpa, uh, that Grandpa was always calling Grandma beautiful. He always looked at her and said, you are so beautiful. Even when his dementia was at its peak, he would forget who Cindy was, in this case, sharing this with me, and then look at Mom and say, you are so beautiful. He had such a love for Grandma. We all witnessed this incredible relationship our whole lives between our grandparents, and I think that is the first legacy of love, is in their relationship that they showed to us. Uh, Allison, my Aunt Sunny here, said, I was surprised to learn that one reason Mom loved her house is that it would be a place for nieces and nephews to live in when they came for school. She built the apartment downstairs primarily for any family that would need it. Coming out to school for BYU, family dinners always included any extended family, Boyacks, Couches, Amundsen's, whoever was here. They were always welcome and adored by all. Everyone was loved and invited. Many times I came home from school and mom was on the phone with a friend, crying on her shoulder because she was always that good friend. When our neighbors, the Zwallens, lived next door, she took them out on their errands and shopping. She was a taxi driver for many friends and family over the years. 
She was the one that many friends who were having a hard time would call and talk to to vent. Uh, Becky continues, mom always wanted a lot of people around, especially family. Again, she treated everyone as if they were her favorite. And I really think everyone was. I couldn't be convinced otherwise. Mom was a good example of how to make people feel special. She was very kind and enjoyed being around everyone. She loved people, loved to laugh, and wanted everyone to join in with her. So keep laughing while you watch me in the big t-shirt here. <laughs> she was unselfish, something I noticed from an early age. She taught us to think of others before ourselves. Whenever we had a friend, a guest, or anybody come over, uh, she gave them first choice. She would demonstrate this by treating us as her guests. One small example, this is my mom actually sharing this, she, she bought a candy bar one time, tucked it in her purse for a later time, uh, but one of us discovered it, got excited, so she took it out, cut it into eight small pieces, because we also had a friend with us, and then she let everybody choose first, and she took the smallest piece left and didn't act disappointed at all. So my mom, as a child, is watching this occur, which may seem like an insignificant action, but very significant. And she did this with everything throughout her whole life. She would look for opportunities for us to reach out to others and make new friends, to cherish our current friends, and look out for others to come to be a part of our group. She did this so enthusiastically, even taking us right up to meet someone close to our age that she had spotted. And in fact, some of my dearest lifetime friends began with my mom, trying to teach us the value of reaching out to include others. And this was a group text, so Uncle Jim just said ditto to everything, <laughs> which I think is exactly right. These are all small, but real examples of love. She was doing little things with great love, and that cannot be insignificant. It's all these smaller moments of love that add up to making us who we are today, all of us. This kind of love is always relational and totally inclusive. And her most important achievement was exactly this, these small moments of being in loving relationship with all of us, never expecting anything in return, never holding reasons not to love. It was unconditional, and this is true love, to always accept and give no matter what. We had to do nothing to earn her love. This is one of my favorite quotes that I had to share by Therese of Lisieux. She said, God knows all the sciences, but there's one science God does not know. God does not know mathematics. God knows nothing about mathematics, meaning, there is no measuring, there is no, uh, no way that we have to count or be in any way deserving of grandma's love. It, it just can't be equal. There's no addition, no subtraction. She's, she was never counting or weighing or make, measuring anything. She never required any kind of payment in return. Love only expands and includes more and more. There's really no other way for love. And if it's not including, it's not love. So her message, I think, to all of us was that you are already good. You always have been. Love continually includes more. And this is the good news. This is the gospel, that all is forgiven, all is healed. You are all inherently good, all is loved, all is forgiven, included in this. This is the love that I experienced from my grandma and I feel is the greatest legacy that she left for all of us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. While the, while the family's gathering, I wanted to point out that Gail was very insistent that the words be printed to the, what we're singing on the back of the program. She wants you to read through this 
program and just understand the meaning of the words written by Oliver Wendell Holmes. So if you have one handy, read along. I think uh, Gail would be so happy.
Hey, everybody. Um, so like Melissa, there's way too much content uh, from grandma to be able to fit this in five minutes. So I had a hard time whittling this down. Um, I'll give it my best, though. So I'm Dan, by the way. Um, Allison's son. Um, so I don't know how, but um, to say that grandma's life was built on music would almost be a tragedy of an understatement. It was somehow more than that. She was almost the embodiment of music. And as cheesy as that sounds, if you think about her passion, energy, love, and general disposition, her stories, and even her laughter, it's hard not to think of music. Um, she started playing the piano at five years old, and her mother Cecil exchanged hair curlings for grandma's piano lessons. Grandma loved the little piano in, oh, she, she, she loved the little piano in their home, and she said she spent so much time on it that she wore out the bench. She loved to sing and dance in her front room as a child and loved to listen to her mother sing all the old tunes. She started playing the piano for various callings when she was 12 and continued serving in, in musical callings throughout her entire life, almost constantly. Grandma was a complete performer in everything she did. Even from a young age, she loved to perform and make music productions of all kinds of, of, or for all kinds of occasions. Um, she was fearless and she learned from her mistakes to continue in her music growth. As a teenager, Grandma loved performing in various choirs, plays, and assemblies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after her first year of college, she went down to Zion as a camp maid, where she and her friends would perform a summer program each night for the tourists. And Grandma would dress as a sailor and sing Honey Bun. She also performed in melodramas and directed a choir while she was down there. Um, more on that later, but. Uh, Grandma took piano lessons up through college when she wanted to start the violin. A professor told her she was too old to start the violin, but he was in desperate need of a bass viola player for his orchestra. So Grandma took six lessons of viola and found herself sitting in the orchestra playing the first note of every measure. <laughs> she, she said, my soul soared with music playing all around me. It was one of the most thrilling moments I have ever experienced and I was able to gradually add more notes into the measures. She said, my mother went to the first concert and was very amused to see the other bass player's hands moving all over while I was slowly playing one note every measure. <laughs> and of course, Grandma laughed about that. Um, she filled her life with music, and Grandpa was no exception to that rule. She may have fallen in love with him in high school in the first place because of his impressive masterpiece, The Boogie Woogie which became a staple performance at many family gatherings until the end of his life. They were both accomplished piano players and loved to play duets where they would nudge and tease each other when one of them messed up a measure or missed a page turn. They both sang, the, uh, they both sang in the Woodward Chorale for decades and would travel together along with the choir to perform. They loved watching musicals, laughing at all the same parts. It is certainly no wonder um, that music was one of the four family values that they had. Um, a few of Grandma's most cherished times in music were when she sang in a trio with uh, Anna Mae Curtis and Bonnie Dewey, where they would perform throughout the state in various programs. They called themselves the second bests because they were all three um, second sopranos. And she also got involved in a skit where she played Mary Poppins. And she, along with, uh, I hope I don't mess these names up, Blanche, Blanche Sheffield, Jean Dixon, and Barbara Taylor, uh, traveled through the state performing at Relief Society luncheons for over 10 years. And many of us still remember Grandma in her Mary Poppins uniform that she would always dress in for <laughs> random things. <laughs> um, <laughs> Grandma never stopped learning and improving in her musical talents. In her late 50s, she went back to school to learn more about music. She said, that took courage. I even had the gall to take singing lessons at 50. And for those of you who know Grandma's voice, she didn't need it. She said, I guess I was quite an experiment for those two vocal instructors. 
During that time, she was asked to be cast as a feisty old woman who would play the piano for a community tap dance class in a play called Stepping Out. She was amongst the cast of younger students, and she considered that one of the scariest times in her musical endeavors. Though she wasn't the lead, she, she shined as the total highlight and funniest part of the show as a member of the supporting cast. Um, wish I could have seen that one. Some of my first memories of Grandma were of Brad and I sitting in her basement watching her teach my sister Katie and uh, my cousins Andrea and Amy um, group and individual piano lessons from those beginner Charlie Brown Peanuts books. Um, and she, she taught piano for over 25 years in her basement. And in her words, she said, I taught mainly beginners. I wanted to see if I could inspire them to love music. And Grandma did inspire a lot of love and talent for music, um, not only in this family, but in this world. Uh, from the collective Keith family's beautiful vocals that we just barely had the privilege to witness, um, and who knows how many instruments are in that family nowadays, uh, down to Katie, my sister Katie and Julie's incredible songwriting ability, and uh, down to Chris's un uncanny ability to shred death metal on his guitar. We have all witnessed and felt that inherited contagious passion. Um, watching grandma lead music could make any music conductor look about as fun as watching a dead cactus in the middle of a windless desert. She used all of her emotion and all of her movement to conduct. She poured all her love for God and music into her conducting, completely hypnotizing everyone who watched. Entire congregations would, walk, would talk about how they loved how enthusiastic Grandma was. She would take up the whole stage just to lead the congregation through the hymns. So Katie can do a better impression of this, but she's, she's sitting, you know. Um, so she would gasp when she led, with, when everybody was supposed to take a, a breath, you know? <laughs> so we could come. And uh, she would make flourishes when you had to crescendo or sustain like the, you know? So she was amazing. And um, you could have easily confused her methods with interpretive dancing the hymns but you couldn't help but sing and follow her lead. She also inspired music through directing pageants for children and youth and adults from what I understand. I don't, she did so many things that I wasn't able to get, get my hands on. Um, for example, she, um, or some of the more notable ones I guess were, were when she directed a nativity production with primary kids where she got a bunch of professionals from BYU to narrate and handle all the sound and filming equipment. That video is still floating around the family in various places. Many of us have, or almost, I'm sure all of us have seen it actually at some point. <laughs> um, and then she also directed a youth pageant um, with a youth chorus and orchestra performing from Kamara's Hill that she pulled my sister Katie into so she could be a part alongside with her cousins, even though we didn't live in the state. And Grandma also inspired music in the family because she would be genuinely enamored with and listen with great enthusiasm to any child, grandchild, or great-grandchild willing to perform anything musical. I suppose that also applied to in-laws, seeing as how excited, or seen as how, seen how excited uh, Grandma was to have Hiram enter the family. <laughs> Hiram's an amazing pianist and opera singer, and he does everything. So... Anyways, uh, yeah, and also how she, how she loved my uh, dad's traditional um, Christmas concerts. She, she, she um, I guess, beautiful or terrible, fast or slow, beginner or professional, um, grandma would make you feel like royalty for showing off any musical ability, ability to her. She did this up until the very end when my dad would play his up-and-coming fiddle skills for her in the last few weeks of her life. Okay, so here comes the speed round of favorite family memories <clears throat> relating to music. Ready? First and foremost, Grandma yelling, get up, dud, and play us the boogie woogie. 
grandpa lumbering slowly over to the piano, I suspect is a part of the dramatic drawn out effect, because then he would start to play the beginning slowly at first and then quickly move into the raucous piece that it was, with grandma yelling at everyone, come on everybody, get up and dance, as she danced the twist and wagged her finger in the air, you know. And um, she wouldn't stand for anyone sitting while Grandpa jammed out the rest of the song, so the entire room would be up and dancing. Um, countless CD exchanges with everyone who showed interest, where she um, would often have to play a sample of her favorite tracks on her stereo there in the kitchen um, before actually letting you put your hands on it to borrow. Um, grandma tugging at your sleeve and saying, oh, play me something, would you? <laughs> Mostly to Katie and our family. <laughs> um, grandma's interrupting outbursts of song during conversation. Um, it made me laugh to see she had written about this one. She said, I will add in laughing tone how I grab onto words in conversation that um, match words in many lines of song, and then I sing them out loud or under my breath. Um, I'm sure we have all been on the other end of these conversations, where you're mid-sentence when Grandma sings back to you what you just said in some famous tune. <laughs> Most notoriously, none of us will ever be able to turn over a diamond trump card in the card game Oh Heck without the tune burned into our brains. Everybody, I'm gonna, we're going to do this together, okay? Hmm, diamonds are a girl's best friend, <laughs> right? So she, <laughs> we played, I mean, all of us have played countless hours of, of that game, Oh Heck, with Grandma and Grandpa, and therefore we've heard countless times, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Um, yeah, anyways, uh, this will also go down in history. Uh, the 4th of July Grandma Parade, when Grandma would make us all line up single file while Grandpa grilled burgers, and then go marching around the neighborhood as she would count the the beats of our march and sing 76 trombones as she acted like a grand marshal by dancing, entertaining, and yelling at her neighbors as we snaked through the middle of the streets of her neighborhood. <laughs> to be sure, a teenage boy's living nightmare <laughs> whose humiliation was only assuaged because A, he was laughing too hard at his grandma, and B, her eccentric lead of the procession soaked up 100% of the attention so you could hardly be noticed even if you tried. Um, another one is grandma breaking out into song during sacrament meeting talks <laughs> and baptism talks and anything else. Um, anytime any kind of music was playing in the house, uh, this is my mom's, grandma would enter into the room dancing and leading to the beat um, in her crazy way. And also for my mom, she remembers uh, singing all the old songs for five hours on the drive from Provo to Pocatello every time they went. Um, <laughs> which would be a fantastic time. Um, this is kind of a side one, but that when Grandma was directing the ward choir through the Battle Hymn of the Republic, she went to the back of the chapel so she could hear the dynamics. And when the choir was singing the line with glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me, she yelled across the chapel, men, hold the bosom! <laughs> Guess she got a lot of heat for that one after. Um, another thing we'll never forget is Grandma's beautiful vibrato and energy as she sang. That will forever be burned into our memories. Um, when Grandma was in the care center after, um, after doing her radiation, uh, she was telling my brother uh, Brad and his wife Tata the story of when she and Grandpa went to visit, or oh, sorry, when Grandpa came to visit her in Zion um, before they got married. And Brad said that when Grandma was telling her the part about dressing up as a sailor and singing Honey Bun, um, she started dancing and bouncing in the hospital bed <laughs> as she sang. And she could never contain her enthusiasm. And when Grandma got sick, this is a sweet memory. When Grandma got sick, Every time she was getting nervous about things, she would turn on music, or have my mom turn on music. My mom said music was very soothing to her and a huge comfort um, when she was especially ill in those last few months. Um, 
even to the point that the tabernacle choir was playing softly when she died. And my mom said she had a hard time finding uh, soft and quiet and calming music for her in grandma's music collection, so props to her for finding some quiet stuff eventually to calm her down. Uh, I told myself I wouldn't do this, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to read a few quotes from her really quick, um, and then I'll end. She said, I have always found great joy in music, all styles and varieties. I guess that my foot naturally taps to any beat. Um, she said, I have lived my life in song. I realize that music has kept my soul flying high. I am so grateful and blessed to feel music in my soul. And I, uh, I know that we are also so blessed as well to feel music in our soul because of her, whether musical or not. Um, there's grandma's whole character, yeah, was musical. And uh, we'll miss her dearly. Say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I can't top that. I think you've heard enough about laughter, so I'm going to stop. No. Uh, I don't, I've, I've learned a lot uh, over the years in my career to, to quit writing down a planned talk because I never follow it. So I'm not going to follow what I was thinking of doing today since a lot of it's already been said. There's so many things that be, bring out laughter in our lives. and. Uh, <laughs> Even though mom was known for the most, dad still had his wit and character that people loved. So I'm going to start a little different. <clears throat> uh, I'm the, the poster child of what not to wear in the family. And uh, always have been. Never been the fashion. Um, always teased growing up at school wearing my tough skin instead of Levi's. And mom would always say, just laugh at people. Just laugh at them. They, they, don't, they don't know what you have. OK, great. So I've learned a lot to laugh at everything I do. <laughs> and it's infectious because in my career, uh, just coming back from California as a project manager for a long time doing websites, and uh, it's infectious, the Dudley laugh. And I was told this so many times that it became the last few years that VPs and other departments all through Honda and the different products were requesting from my management, could we have Dud the Jovial Fat Man be our project manager for this project? <laughs> now I can tell you I am not the best project manager. Rarely did I do it in time, done correctly and on in budget, but the business stakeholders loved every part of the journey. I made sure they were happy. I made sure it delivered what our customers wanted. And I'm not trying to brag about me here, but I want to use that as an example of what's been taught from both my mother and father. All my sisters, which are part of my five mothers, <laughs> all my... <laughs> All of us have had an infectious, blessed personality to make others around us have joy, to laugh. And, and I think that's an important part. Um, a lot of the things I wanted to share, you guys already did. And by the way, Melissa, even though mom treated everybody as favorites, I truly am the favorite son. <laughs> and all my other mothers, I'm your favorite brother. Don't forget it. Uh, but, wow, you've shared so many great things that uh, is a pure example of my parents. A couple things I'm just going to add to finish this off is my dad. 
I used to get a kick out of hearing him speak, and it wasn't just in church, but it was in his education weeks, which I got to go a lot on, and everywhere he talked, he'd come up and serious, he'd say something, and then he'd start, <laughs> he'd start laughing. Then everybody realized that was a funny thing, so they'd start laughing. And I found out later from other comments that they were laughing at him rather than his joke, at his laugh. So I've always remembered that growing up about him, so I'd get a kick out of him uh, presenting, and, but he loved it. He loved humor, he loved to add it. We always grew up uh, watching shows with uh, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, everybody knows. A lot of the old best reruns, Andy Griffith, Sid Caesar show. This was the kind of stuff he wanted his family, good humor to enjoy and learn that you don't need stuff that's popular in the world out there to be happy. You can make your own happiness. You can watch these good, clean things and still have a great time and great joy and share that with others. Share your laughter. And I don't even need to touch on mom and her ability to do that. But I just wanted you to know dad really set a lot of that in our lives. Um, and, and it's just been amplified by mom and her personality. Because <laughs> I got to go see a lot of the Mary Poppins shows, and maybe a lot of you didn't. I got to see the play Dan talked about. And I can tell you, after the play, when they'd line up out and, and, and you could walk by uh, at BYU where it was done, you could walk by and shake hands with all the actors. The biggest group was at my mom. And she was a, what did you call it, a sub, a supporting actor, actor. She stole the show. And, uh, and I could hear the director guy saying, oh yeah, yeah, she was awesome. And he'd try and get him to look at others. Everybody, no, we want to talk to her, she's awesome. I always remembered that. And uh, I thought it was great, because I saw the same thing happen to all the Mary Poppins shows. And people were calling because of the way she dynamically made that thing happen. Uh, I mean, Blanche and Barbara and Jean Dixon all, all supporting. It was mom that drew it <laughs> together, because that's your impression. Well, she was Mary Poppins, singing all the songs, dancing around in the costume, and she's, she's this show person. And uh, I got to watch a lot of that, and it was so cool. Um, but I don't know what else to add. You've heard so many great things. I think uh, I just want to close with I feel gifted and blessed because of both my mom and dad, and I believe my sisters feel the same. I think we, we enjoy laughter, and I think it's the best medicine in the world. We have priorities that we've learned from their other legacies already talked about. They instilled that in our lives. And uh, I, I was just excited that I could share some more laughter because that's my favorite thing to do. And uh, I just love them to death at Louisville. But sorry, my eyes are sweating. Um, <laughs> but they were great examples to all of us. And I'm so happy they're together again, making people laugh in heaven. Can't wait till we see him again. Share in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, I hope I don't detract from just the marvelous um, and edifying spirit that's been here today. I want to thank all the family for your testimony of joy and of example that uh, you've nourished me today. Thank you so much, and thank you for the music. That was just, it was just beautiful. I am thankful to be in a world where I could, for a season, be proximate with the Dudleys. Uh, Brother Dudley would play the piano at the beginning of priesthood meeting, which was like having a Ferrari stopped at a Texaco. I don't know what the right metaphor is, but he was just marvelous. He brought, he brought everybody up. He elevated all of us. Uh, we moved in in 2007, and um, Gail was the first friend that my wife, Amy, made. Does that shock you? Probably not. They lived on that blind corner, and we had little kids, and so my, my wife taught the kids a song that went kind of like this. Keep on the Dudley side, always on the Dudley side. <laughs> Meaning as you were walking out the neighborhood, if you were not on the Dudley side, you would get run over. So I'm <laughs> thankful for that. I'm thankful for that message, keeping on the Dudley side. I like that metaphor. I think that works for me too. I'm going to read a, a poem. I hope that's OK with, with uh, uh, Gail and Duane. This is a sonnet from John Donne. And it's an interesting sonnet because he is speaking to death in a mocking tone, putting death in his place. And here are the words uh, John Donne says, death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men and women with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul delivery. Thou art slave, remember he's still speaking to death. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppier charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke, why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. So just as St. George slays the dragon in the medieval tale, Jesus is the great death slayer. O death, where is thy sting? asks Paul. O grave, where is thy victory? The victory is Christ's over death. Paul continues, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most miserable. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And the Book of Mormon teaches the same. There is a resurrection. Therefore the grave hath no victory, and the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world. The Book of Mormon also teaches the profound irony that Christ was victorious over death because he subjected himself to it. That everyone might become subject to him. Also profound is the teaching that death comes to us all to fulfill the merciful plan of our great creator. What kind of mercy is that to make us mourn? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. We believe, and I believe the Dudleys believed, that when we pass, we experience not an end, but a new beginning, essentially a change in scenery. What does Sister Dudley know now? that we don't yet know, I wonder. Our consciousness, that distinct and eternal spark that makes us us, lives on and solely for a time until our corruptible bodies become incorruptible and our spirit and new body become inseparably connected. Joseph Smith taught that we cannot be fully joyful without the glorified resurrection. In our mourning, we look forward to that day when there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, 
and God shall wipe away all the tears from our eyes, and we will be embodied again like our heavenly parents are. The image I have of Gail is much like uh, uh, what was uh, presented up here. I'm not going to imitate it. That was perfect, what you did. But it's of her standing up here leading the music in sacrament meeting with her whole body and with her whole soul leaning in 3D over the edge here as she conducted. There she is leaning forward, her eyes so concentrated on us that sometimes she forgets the lyrics of the song that we're singing. And her arms were fully and organically and dramatically beckoning us to follow her dynamic lead and to be better than we actually were. I'd like to imagine that she beckons us still. I testify that the gospel of Jesus Christ is hope and that Jesus Christ himself is light and life, the great dragon slayer of death. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll now conclude this wonderful service by singing together, I think the world is glorious. You have the words here on the program. Uh, after which Lynn Hendrickson, a home teacher and minister forever, will give the closing prayer. Uh, the the uh, grave service, the dedication of the grave, will be given by Edwin D. Riding, his son-in-law. And I'll, I'll, I'll stand after the closing prayer and invite you to stand as we see the, the procession out. Thank you. So I don't need to say any more about how Gail was a wonderful chorister. And she was my hero. I always wanted her to lead the singing at my funeral. And here I am endeavoring to do it at hers. So this is our chance as a community to give her a good send off. Uh, this is a beautiful primary song. The words are meaningful. Let's give it our all, okay? Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, we rejoice this day for the privilege we have had of knowing Sister Gail Dudley as a neighbor and friend, as a sister in the gospel, and as a mother and grandmother in so many other roles she has played. She has now departed us, but we know that she has gone on to bigger and better things. And we are grateful for the memories that she leaves us. And she will always be with us in that way. We're grateful for the conviction we have that she is now with her beloved husband and awaiting other family members. We for the memories we have of her, for her joyous spirit, her love of life, for her sense of humor, her love of music, and the many other things that have been expressed in this service today. Please bless and be with her family. We will miss her. Let them be comforted in the knowledge of the gospel.
gospel or good news. That by his son, Jesus Christ, has paid the price to redeem us and to give us the gift of resurrection when that time will come. We're grateful for him and his great love and strength to pass the test and fulfill his part in the great plan of eternal life, the great plan of salvation, and the great plan of happiness. And this we say in his holy name, even Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, please rise. Will the pallbearers please come forward? family will follow the casket. Thank you, brothers and sisters.